Hello everyone, and thank you for joining KDB's Meetup in the Cloud. My name is Jack Stapleton, and I will be taking you through how to scale the real-time database. So we want to do this for two main reasons. Uh, the first one is cost efficiency, um, and the second is resiliency. So cost efficiency was, um, instead of paying for one very large server that's going to be empty at the beginning of the day, um, we want to be able to start very small and then scale up um, along with demand. Um, and when it comes to resiliency, uh, abnormally large volumes of data can, can take out or already be, and, and this kind of spells disaster. So what we want to be able to do is, when those abnormal volumes of data come in, we want to be able to scale up, um, so we have the ability to handle handle those volumes. Um, also, we need to assume that the ODB is going to go down at some point, um, and if the ODB is, is just on one process um, and not sharded, it, taking that much data off disk is, is going to take too long, um, especially if it happens later in the day. So how are we going to do this? Uh, the initial deployment is going to look very similar. We're going to have one ticker plant, one ORDB, and one gateway. Um, but this is going to be sharded across multiple servers. Um, so the ORDB is going to come up, it's going to subscribe, um, and it's going to start filling up with data. As it fills up, it's, it's going to request um, an extra server from the auto-scaling group. Um, and then while that server comes up, it will continue to fill. Um, and once it's full, the ticker plant will stop publishing to that ORDB and it will start publishing to the next one. Um, so pretty simple, as soon as it's full, it moves on. Uh, this cycle will keep happening throughout the day. Um, and then you'll have a bunch of, of rolled ORDBs with data available to be queried, and you'll have the ticker plant still just publishing to one, uh, waiting for it to fill up. And then at the end of day, uh, the ORDBs will clear their memory as usual, or clear their data from memory as usual, but they'll also terminate the server. So we'll scale back down again, and then this process will start all over again. So it will stay quite low until the data fills up, and then we'll start to increase. So we're going to deploy this on Amazon. So how are we going to do it? The first thing we're going to need is an Amazon machine image. And the reason we're going to need this is because we're going to be launching multiple servers. So very simple, we're going to launch a server, uh, set up the Amazon command line interface, install Miniconda and KDB, um, and then add our auto-scaling code. And then we're going to take an image. Um, and then we're going to get a CloudFormation template, which is going to use that image to launch all the servers, along with IAM roles and security, so that um, these servers can talk to each other. So how are we actually going to scale up? Um, there's a number of ways we can do this where Amazon can handle it. We can kind of publish Cloud CloudWatch metrics, and Amazon can automatically scale up based on certain metrics we set. Um, but we're going to want to be very particular about when we scale up, and particularly what servers we take down when we scale in, because yeah, we do not want an RDB that's going to come down if it's part of the live rotation. Um, so the way we're going to do this is, is code the RDBs to actually make these auto scaling calls to adjust the desired capacity um, on the uh, in real time. So how are we going to do this? So the first thing we're going to need to do is launch a CloudFormation stack. Um, so we're going to choose new resources, Upload a template. Choose this one here. So this is just a YAML file with um, information on what what Amazon resources we want to provision. So I'm going to call this ASG. ODB. What you call this doesn't really matter. It just needs to be uh, distinct. So for the AMI of our servers, we're going to go grab the one we have just made with our code on it, um, choose an SSH key. For the T3, for the ticker plant, we're gonna choose a T3 medium. Make it a bit bigger than the ODBs. The ODBs are gonna be a T3 micros. Um, and then these are very small, so we should see start, should see it start to scale up quite quickly. And um, for the scale threshold, we're gonna have it at 40. So that means at 40% memory usage, we're gonna request a new uh, server for the uh, from the auto scaling group and the roll threshold will be 80%. So once the ODB is 80% full, um, the ticker plant will roll to the next ODB. Uh, everything's okay here. And then, because we're creating an IAM roll, we need to take, okay, creating an IAM roll so that the EC2 instances themselves can um, scale the auto scaling group. So, just need to wait for this now. So once the stack is complete, um, we can go and have a look at the auto scaling groups that it would have made. And we can see that each of them have one instance. 
Um, and the reason they have one instance is this desired capacity attribute. Um, so the auto scanning group will always try and match this desired capacity. So we edit that and change it to two. Um, we'll see that the auto scanning group tries to update and it will try launch another another server for us. So if we quickly run over to instances, um, we can see the servers that are already running and we'll SSH onto the RDB and we'll try to do exactly that. We'll try find the auto scanning group and increment the desired capacity attribute um, by one. So first things first, we need to find the instance itself and we can use that to then find the auto scanning group that it is a part of. So we can do that using this EC2 metadata function. So this is the ID of the instance. And then we will query AWS um, for uh, the information about this instance and it will give it back in JSON. Um, so if we scroll up a bit, we can see that the RDB is a part of this auto scanning group here. So now we can run a very similar function and um, doing do it over auto scanning group name. So now we can see the desired capacity is two. So if we want to increment that, we'd simply add one, set desired capacity and give it three. So now very quickly, if we go back to our auto scanning group, when we refresh, it should be up to three. So we have two instances, one is being started. Cool. So we'll be able to do this in queue um, by just using um, system commands and .j.k to parse the, parse the results. We're just gonna wrap that other query in a system. Um, and now we can just maybe call .j.k on this. That will give us a rather nasty looking dictionary. Save that down to X and then have a look at what auto scanning groups is. Let's say table and first we give us a dictionary. So the important bits here that we need are the auto scanning group name and the desired capacity is three. So then if we were to run our set desired capacity function again we will get this here, same group name, up it by one and run. And then we go back out again to our auto scanning group and hopefully it's updated and it has. Cool. These AWS queries can, can take a while to run. So we, we don't really want them to run in the RDB because you might have some buffering concerns there from the ticker mat, from the ticker plant. Um, so we, we run a monitor process um, in queue alongside the RDB on the same server. And we load that in by just loading monitor. And so what happened here it is set the timer and is running this .z.ts function. Um, and the important one here is the monitor memory. Um, what this is looking at is just the memory usage for the box. This will give us a percentage, it's only at 8% at the moment. And it will compare that to the, the scale threshold is set as an environment variable on the box. So that's at 40%. So as soon as the memory usage goes above 40, it'll call this util function here, which basically does what we've just done. Um, and it will take the group name. And we already have that with uh, loaded in the script. So if we run that again, we will see that we are on to a fifth instance. And there we are. And now that we know how we're, the RDBs are going to scale up, we're going to take a look at the ticker plant. Okay, so SSH on, get the IP, and here we go. So to start the server, we will move into our directory where our code is, here. And code looks like this. And then we are just going to call this command here. It works the same way as uh, KDB tick, we're loading the ticker plant file, uh, have an argument here for the schema file, and then this is where to place the logs. So we start up our ticker plant and immediately an RDB has come in. Um, so important to note here is the, the queue that is subscribed for is just the, the auto scanning group and that the column here has been marked live. 
Um, so any further RDBs that come in um, will be added to the queue, but they won't be marked live until this one has rolled. And where does that all happen? It happens in .asg.sub. The first part of this is just checking that the input arguments are okay. So there's a list of tables and a list of symbols um, for those tables. Uh, that .u.w will use. And then there is the record is added to .u.asg.tab. Um, so it's not marked live at this point. Uh, it's first checked whether or not there is a live process uh, for that queue. So for that auto scaling group in this case. If there is, .u.asg.add is called. This works pretty much the same as .u.sub. Uh, adds the handle to .u.w with the tables and sims. Um, the information about the log file and the schemas is sent back down the handle to the RDB so it can replay the log and set the tables. And uh, .u.asg.tab is updated. Um, and the way it does that is, it, it, as we said, it it marks this column as live. And it says, right, this, this RDB started on the very first UPD message. So what's happened here is the RDB has, has scaled up. Um, it's hit that 40% threshold and it started a new RDB um, on handle. Uh, and this RDB is on handle 11. But you can see, even though we're on uh, 5,000 messages, the first RDB still hasn't rolled. So when .u.asg.sub is, is called, um, there is a process that is returned from this query. So .u.asg.add is not called, um, and the RDB is just left waiting. Uh, and it's left waiting for the other RDB to call .u.asg.roll. So uh, that's good timing. Um, so dot u.asg.roll, basically what happens here is that the RDB is finished, it's full, um, so it doesn't want any more data. So it sends its handle and the last UBD message that it that it processed. Um, this is important so that we don't get any data gaps. Its handle is then removed from dot u.w, so it's no longer published to, um, and it's marked as rolled. And then the last UBD message is saved into the last I column which is not the clearest at the moment, but it looks like it is 1058, which is where the next RDB um, will, will take off from. So if there's a gap, um, the RDB, the second RDB will start replaying the log from there. And then this cycle will continue. So you can see more RDBs are coming up. RDBs come up, they'll be added to .u.asg.tab. When they're full, they'll call .u.asg.roll and the next RDB will take over. So we want to try visualize what's happening here. We can we can put it together a little dashboard. So very simply in the top bar charts, we are plotting the memory total and memory usage of each server. So you can see each one fills up to about 80%. And, and the fourth one here is on its way up. And in the bottom graph, we can see uh, the memory usage of each server plotted over time. So you can see each one kind of fills up slowly. And, it starts a new server and then when it hits around 80% again, it rolls the subscriber and it moves on to the next one. Uh, interesting one is here where there's a bit of a blip and it spikes quite quickly. Um, I think we can assume there that the RDB fell behind and, and had a good bit of data to replay from the log. Um, and then if we're to look at the memory usage of the whole cluster, we can see the memory usage is slowly rising up, whereas the mem total, which is the I suppose the total gigabytes in RAM that we're using from AWS, um, goes up in steps with each instance. This can kind of be seen as the cost of the cluster and anything above the blue line can be can be seen as savings. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, joining the meetup and listening to the talk. Um, if you're looking for any more information on this, the white paper is up on code.kx now. Um, and I think we're gonna open it up to questions.